Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. It goes without saying that reggae music is among the biggest genres of music on jazz green earth, with hundreds of millions of fans immersed heavily in the best of roots, dance hall and lovers rock, as well as the other infectious subgenres of the art form. Though dance hall has in recent years overtaken roots reggae as a dominant sound in Jamaica and quite a number of other places, Roots Reggae has over the last five decades remained as arguably the number one sound in Mama Africa. Not only does Roots Reggae possess several elements of the motherland culture like the Naibingi drums and spiritual themes, but the birth of Roots Reggae was sparked by the visit to Jamaica of one of Africa's most famous sons in the person of Emperor Haile Selassie I in April 1966. The incredible bond between Jamaica and Africa has its roots in the teachings of Marcus Garvey that would birth the Rastafarian movement, which in turn became the unofficial custodians of Africa's heritage in Jamaica. The Rastafarian ideology infiltrated Jamaican music as it was evolving from rocksteady in the late 1960s. The Rasta influence would infuse heavy spiritual, social and politically charged themes and when all wrapped up together would become what is known as Roots Reggae. Though Jamaican music was always popular in Africa since the days of ska, it was roots reggae in the 1970s, loaded with inspiring messages of African unity, resistance to the oppressors, denunciation of neo-colonialism and corruption that would truly resonate with Africans. Roots reggae would form the soundtrack for revolution, social change and hope in the midst of insurmountable odds that the average African has dealt with for decades. Let's take a look at Africa's unbreakable romance with roots reggae. As said earlier, Caribbean music had been very popular in Africa by the middle of the 20th century, with Calypso making huge waves by the 1950s and ska really big by the early 1960s. In the early ska era, Jamaican singer Millie Small would go on a groundbreaking tour of several countries in Africa where her song My Boy Lollipop would go up to number one in several countries. The themes and subjects of most of these songs were of a light-hearted and optimistic nature that was in tandem with the prevailing mood on the continent. That was the period of decolonization as many countries were getting independence from their European colonial rulers and hope of Africa entering into a new age of prosperity was really high. But in 1964, a huge wave of oppression in South Africa that culminated in the imprisonment of Nelson Mandela would signal that all wasn't to Huru on the continent yet. The oppression of colored people by the apartheid regime would send shockwaves through Africa and as the 1960s rolled into the 1970s, there was a general sense of demoralization as many African countries had been hit by economic crisis, corruption, civil war and military coups. Optimism had turned into despair and as is often the case, the arts reflect the mood in society, leading many to gravitate from all the feel-good music that had been the rave a few years earlier. But 12,000 kilometers away, a massive cultural shift in Jamaica would birth a new sound that would resonate with the African experience in an unprecedented way. In April 1966, Emperor Haile Selassie I would make a legendary visit to Jamaica. That visit would legitimize the Rastafarian communities and led to thousands of Jamaican artists converting to that faith. Singers like Ritamali, The Wailers and Toots and the Matos are among the first wave of Rastafarian musicians and the themes of their music would become dominated by subjects of spirituality and social consciousness with Africa celebrated as the promised land and the home of all Africans in the diaspora. The lyrics by these Rasta singers were quite confrontational calling out the very existential threats that Africans were going through like no genre of music had ever done before and whether it was police brutality, unemployment or corruption, there was a reggae artist or song that would always speak to the listener. At the time, the first core constituency of reggae fans were the unemployed neighborhood dudes, radical college students and their teachers and of course the herb smokers and Roots Reggae became the voice that expressed the frustrations of people on a failing continent that was being destroyed by Babylon that came in the form of their own oppressive governments but for all that was going wrong continent-wide, South Africa would be the rallying point and spark for reggae music to truly explode in popularity as the background music of continent-wide resistance. In 1976, the whole world was appalled by the bloodshed in what is now known as the Soweto Uprising. And that atrocity inspired the first known anti-apartheid song by Jamaican band The Mighty Travelers that was titled South Africa and was released in the same year. But Mali's album Rastaman Vibration also came out in the same year. Tracks like War and Crazy Baldhead providing heavy symbolism about the situation on the motherland 
and touches the militant masterpiece album Equal Rights with songs like his title track Equal Rights, Apartheid, Down Pressure Man and others poke the finger directly in the eye of the oppressor in Africa and would win over literally millions of new fans all over the continent. By 1978, a homegrown roots reggae movement was birthed when Nigerian singer and EMI recording artist Tony Okosun released his album Fire in Soweto that was a smash hit and a resounding success that sold millions of copies all over Africa and was eventually banned in South Africa. And in 1980, Jimmy Cliff would make a groundbreaking visit to South Africa on tour, a musical experience that would inspire a young singer called Lucky Dube to become a reggae artist. But reggae, mind you, wasn't just the theme music for protests in South Africa. It was literally the music played by guerrilla fighters during the Zimbabwean War of Independence. The then rebel army called Zanla PF was said to have played Bob Marley's music on cassette tapes deep in their bush camps to keep their morale high during the war. And by the 1980s, roots reggae was virtually the most popular genre in Africa and the arrowhead of the cultural war against apartheid and oppression everywhere. And as the golden era of reggae music was ending in Jamaica, it was just beginning in the early 1980s in Africa and the continent would produce its own legends. And some of the most popular are Lucky Dube, Alpha Blondie, Majek Fashek, Tijenja Fakoli, Rocky Dawuni, Raskimono, and so many others. And even when Nelson Mandela was freed in 1990 and freedom returned to that country a year later, its influence and role as the music of the underdog in society, I dare say, got even stronger. By the 1990s, there were no more colonial bogeymen to fight, and it became obvious that the African leaders themselves were no better than the foreign colonizers, and reggae became the protest music that would convey deep and insightful commentary about the government without being overly confrontational and stirring the wrath of the authorities. Every description about the government of the day was safely wrapped up in themes about Babylon, but its immense abilities to galvanize public opinion saw it heavily blacklisted and even suppressed on the radio in places like Kenya by the 1980s. And by the end of 20th century, Roots Reggae in Jamaica had been virtually overshadowed by Dancehall with its attendant themes of partying and slackness. And Dancehall also became immensely popular in many other countries in the West and Asia. It definitely had a big following in Africa, but there's no doubt that when you mention reggae in any country on the continent, nobody thinks of Dancehall or Lovers Rock. But what comes to mind immediately are the sinewy rhythms of Roots Reggae complete with all the inspirational messages of resistance to injustice and oppression and the reassurance that Jah will punish the wicked in due time. Kenya, I believe, has the strongest reggae fan base in Africa today and is like a second home to many reggae superstars like Luciano, Richie Spice, Don Carlos and The Burning Spear. In fact, The Burning Spear was scheduled to play a concert there in June but it was cancelled due to recent protests by young people over excessive taxation by the government. And in a clip I saw recently of the protests, I watched a crowd of youngsters marching and singing in unison to Bob Marley's song, Africa Unite. Roots Reggae has always been the people's music and it was conceived to inspire, unite and comfort the oppressed. And over the past five decades, it's done exactly what it was created for and it's done that incredibly well in Africa, serving as a rallying sound to millions of people that despite all Babylon has served them, still strongly hold on to the mantra that better must come. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe, and until next time, jobless.